Good evening, Montgomery County. Thank you so much for being here this evening. My name is Nancy Navarro, and I am the uh, president of the county council this year. I also represent District 4 on the county council, uh, and it has been real, a real honor to work with many of you, with basically all of you, um, to make tonight a reality. Um, I do want to, um, first of all, acknowledge uh, all the hard work of uh, our communications team, my office, uh, to get us to this moment. And I also want to express my appreciation to MCPS for being very collaborative in helping us uh, develop and publish a uh, toolkit that we're going to use. And I will explain to you some of this um, later. Um, so let me get right into it, because this night is really for you. Um, let me explain to you why we're here. Uh, last year, the previous county council adopted a resolution that I introduced uh, in order to uh, communicate and signal our intent to work on a racial, e uh, racial equity and social justice policy. And uh, we all committed that we were going to do this work. We know that there are jurisdictions around the country that have done this work before. And um, I took some time to uh, research that. I also spent a lot of time talking to some community organizations like Impact Silver Spring, um, who have also done some work um, around this issue. Um, along with County Executive uh, Elridge, we also had some joint meetings to talk about, you know, how can we push this forward? And so I made a decision then, um, now as president, to put together a timeline of how we can do this work because this needs to be deliberative work. This needs to be patient work. So we don't want to rush into drafting a piece of legislation without first going through a very deliberative process. So that's why we're here. And we kicked off 2019 with a two-day retreat with where the entire leadership of Montgomery County spent two days at Brookside Gardens um, with the Institute of Racial Equity to go through some of these very important historic, uh, historical facts as well as understanding the root causes that have led to many of the disparities that we see today. And that was just to set the context for uh, what we're going to start doing um, starting this evening. Um, next, uh, of course, is going to be this kind of uh, effort, which is to engage our community in having these conversations. Um, and then with a toolkit that we will share with you later, then you can go into your own neighborhoods or you can go into your synagogues or your temples and, and, and mosques and churches and you can go into just your uh, neighborhood, uh, have a block party, whatever you want to do, but you can have these conversations and then gather that feedback and send it to us so that then uh, in the summer we can start drafting legislation with your input. And so a lot of people say, well, why do, you, why do we need to do this? Um, the truth is that I think basically all of you here have done a lot of work uh, to address issues um, that have to do with disparities and with inequities. And I think in Montgomery County, we feel so strongly about these issues and about empowering our community and about addressing these issues that we have invested a lot of resources and we've also put forth a lot of initiatives in order to address all of these disparities. But in my opinion, we really are lacking a framework a framework that will then guide a lot of this work. We need to be able to benchmark ourselves. We need to ask those questions on the dais whenever there is a proposal, whether it's a land use proposal or it is a budgetary proposal or a piece of legislation. We need to automatically go through the analysis of whether this decision, what will it do? Will it exacerbate some of these disparities or will it begin to eliminate these disparities? And it should not depend on who is in office. It really should be part of how we do our work. So it needs to be structural. And many of us, uh, through a lot of research, we have, of course, understood that a lot of these disparities are the result of structural uh, policies that have led us to this point. So in order to begin to dismantle that, we need to be structural in nature. And that's why we are here. Um, this is not a panacea. This doesn't mean that once we adopt a piece of legislation, we are finished and we can check that box. It's just the beginning, because then it will take the implementation and it will take a lot of careful work over the years, I think, in order to really begin to move the needle. But I started in public service in 2004 when I joined the Board of Education, and I gotta tell you, we're still talking about many of those same issues today. 
I can pull a report from 1998 and it turns out that we can literally copy, copy and paste and it's the same thing. And so I really don't want um, for us to have this conversation again in 10, 15, 20, 30 years and say, wow, it's just the same thing. So that is why we're here. And I really appreciate everybody's commitment to work collaboratively to get us going. So this is our first community forum and um, our amazing uh, member of the Board of Education, the student board member, um, she will dedicate one of her town halls with her peers on this issue. And then we will also begin to facilitate these conversations throughout the county as well. With that, um, what I'd like to do is acknowledge um, my colleagues, um, members of the uh, Montgomery County Council who have worked so hard on this as well. I want to acknowledge, um, and if you can please stand up uh, when I say your name, uh, Council Member Gabe Albornoz is here, and he's an at-large member. Uh, my colleague, Andrew Friedson, he represents District 1. Councilmember Craig Rice, who did, represents District 2. Is he here? I know, there he is. There's Craig. Vice President Sydney Katz, who represents District 3. There's Sydney. Councilmember um, Tom Hawker, who spends a lot of time in this building, I know, because this is his district, District 5. At large member Will Joando is here with us tonight. At large council member Evan Glass. Evan. And council member Hans Riemer, who's also at large. There he is over there. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to um, invite County Executive, I almost said council member, you know, we're still going to that transition. <laughs> County Executive Elrich um, to make some remarks. Thank you. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here today. We started our morning uh, with a press conference on this. Uh, I've noted that today's my 100th day in, in office, and this is one of the things we promised we were going to do in the campaign, and it's really nice to be actually kicking it off. It's the second good thing that happened this week because we also announced the child care initiative. So we're doing things that we think will bend the curve and make a difference, and that's why we do the work we do. I also want to acknowledge that Craig Rice was with me in Annapolis today and we were testifying on the Kerwin Commission um, and you know, asking the state to fully fund education. The time is now to get this done and uh, we've got to make the commitment that every kid in every part of the state uh, gets the education they need and education is not determined by zip codes, race or incomes and uh, that's what the Kerwin Commission is about and it was, it was really nice to be testifying there, and a friendly audience in general, which is also really good. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm very happy about what we're doing. I mean, I started talking with Nancy about this last year. We had some meetings. Uh, we decided we'd put in legislation that would obligate the next council and the next county executive to do this. And uh, I was really glad we did. And I'm very happy that I have the obligation of having to carry this out. And I, th I think um, it's going, to make, it's going to make life a lot easier for a lot of people if we can actually fully do the things we say we want to do. Um, I will say that you know, this, this is not just diversity. Um, anybody who's gone through the racial equity training knows there's a large component that has to do with the African American population in this country. And I want to be uh, blunt, I mean, to kind of tag on to what Nancy said about doesn't, you don't want to be here 10 years from now for doing it. One of the things I told people this morning was uh, seeing the movie I'm Not Your Negro uh, about James Baldwin and the scene in there that's from, I think it's about a 1965 news clip with uh, Dr. King. And he's in the halls of Congress and reporters asking him about all the pushback they're getting on the civil rights legislation. And uh, the reporter's comments to the effect, well, you know, people don't want to pass this now. And Dr. King was comment was to the effect, they want us to wait another 40 years. And what struck me in the movie theater was that 40 years would make it 2005. And he was wrong. 
we're long past 40 years. And we're, things in some ways have gotten worse, not better. Thing, you know, things that we all thought were buried have managed to resurface themselves and uh, in a very ugly way in this country. And it's one of the good things about doing work in Montgomery County, we can actually do this kind of work in a community that largely accepts this kind of work and under understands the importance of being able to do it. Um, so I'm really happy to, you know, to be an elected official in Montgomery County. The other thing that Baldwin said at the end of the movie that I think a lot of us have to come to terms with is um, he was, you know, sort of asked the question about what I guess they call it the, the Negro problem or the black problem. They didn't use the word black back then. And they said it the other way. And he was talking, the question was framed like, so how do you, you know, how do you solve this? And he said, it's not our problem, it's really a white people problem. I said, you know, no matter, and his perception, I think, we've got to think about it. It was like no matter how educated people got, how professional they got, no matter what neighborhoods they lived in, racism sticks with us, and it's still with us. And it's not because black people haven't done anything, it's because white people have had a very hard time adjusting to this. And I think it goes back to, you know, again, going circling back to Dr. King. If we wait for everybody to be ready to accept true equality and deal with these underlying problems, we'll wait forever. This is not something where we have to wait for everybody to adjust to it. It is time. It's long past time. We need to do this kind of work in this county. We can do this kind of work in this county because we have a population that will largely understand it. The notion of putting equity lenses on things and the, I'm going to have an equity office in, in the executive side, is that we're going to make sure that everything any department does is looked at for its impacts on people. Race, gender, you know, anything that you know, differentiates communities, we want to make sure the decisions we make do not unwittingly and unknowingly negatively impact populations. And we need to be more I'd say introspective or thoughtful about the things we do. A lot of people, and you know, I've been on the council 12 years, a lot of people intend to do things for good reasons and try to do things for good reasons, but good reasons don't mean you've looked at the situation carefully enough. And you can try to do something and it either may not reach where you want to go or it may not hit a target that you really need to hit. And, you know, I, I talk to people about my conversation with the African American Health Initiative, any of my friends here from there, where we were talking past each other about what equity and equality meant. And you know, I was arguing that you know, county programs are proportionally distributed according to the amount of diabetes and hypertension you have in your community. And they were saying that's not it. And we spent a while going back and forth and then they raised the issue of how much shorter African American life expectancies are than everything else. And you could treat all the diseases, but the known diseases wouldn't account for some of the pressures that this community is under from their, for their entire lives and the impact those pressures have on their health. And so all the things we thought we were obviously treating aren't necessarily the things that are causing the disparity in life expectancy. And so what seemed like the obvious right thing to do, which is make sure I had the right treatments for the right problems, also showed that we hadn't thought about everything that could affect a person's health and impact. And it certainly made me think about this through a slightly different frame. And I think all of us need to be prepared to look at things through a slightly different frame. But I'm excited, and I cannot believe we have filled this room. This is really exciting. Um, and And I've been here in this room as filled for parties and celebrations, but we're here to work. And that says a lot about you. Anybody who's, who's in this room now, sitting or standing in respect to the folks at the back, um, you came here tonight because you care about this and you want to work on the underlying issues and you want to be part of a solution. So I want to thank you all for coming out. I look forward to the rest of the evening. I thank Nancy for her you know, long work on this. It's been almost a year since we started hatching how we were going to go about doing this. And this is a good culmination of the first year. And I thank the council members who supported this. The fact that you have the entire council here, I says something about the commitment 
of the council to get this right. So we've got, a, I think, a united and dedicated group of people who understand what we're about to undertake and are willing to undertake it. So thank you all. He's taking my papers. Um, I will also, I just want to acknowledge that Montgomery County Public Schools, uh, Montgomery College, Park and Planning, Universities of Shady Grove have been real partners in this and the idea is that we really want to align whatever work we do with them as well so that we are tracking everything in a systemic way. So I do want to thank them for that. All right, so moving right along, we do have now a uh, video segment on racial equity and social justice. This will be just a short video, five minutes, and then we'll get into the meat of the evening, which is the work. So, um, whatever. Systemic racism is a painful, widespread problem in society, and even right here in Montgomery County. Systemic racism is a painful, widespread problem in society, and even right here in Montgomery County. Though we are a welcoming community that embraces its diversity, there are still disparities that exist in ethnicity, education, income, health, and other factors that prevent our ability for future prosperity. I want to thank all my colleagues this um, resolution to develop an equity policy framework in county government. In recognizing this, the county council, led by President Nancy Navarro and now County Executive Mark Elrich, developed a resolution that would create an equity policy framework in county government. That would require the county to question how budget and policy decisions impact equity. So we talk about the academic achievement gap, the uh, health care gaps that exist and disparities. We talk about income gaps. Um, and so what we're referring to right there are particular uh, communities are just proportionally affected in a negative way when it comes to access and when it comes to outcomes. That's why it is so important then for policymakers to have a very structural mechanism to not only examine those gaps, but understand if the decisions that we are making exacerbate or actually close those disparities. You're dealing with policymakers, you just say, so, you know, who's affected by this decision? Um, I, th I think people have just gotten used to not thinking about some of these things. You know, your job um, can get so isolated that you don't think about the long-term effects uh, on communities or decisions you make. I think you have to you have to make it normal by constantly talking about it and making people aware of it. The council's Office of Legislative Oversight recently released its report, Racial Equity in Government Decision Making, which contains practices for advancing racial equity in government. In compiling this report, OLL examined census data compiled by the Urban Institute for Montgomery County, which revealed wide racial disparities in several areas here. Income, home ownership, and education. So in the case of the achievement gap, of course, we know that African-American and Latino students do not do as well as their white or Asian counterparts. So what does that mean in a county, for example, a public school system where Latino students are the majority and where we know that we have an ambitious goal of economic development and workforce development, these are students that are not gonna be able to necessarily become part of that vibrant workforce. How you doing? Good. The council believes eliminating these disparities is an economic imperative. Work kicked off at the new year with the first in a series of racial equity training sessions for county employees provided by the Racial Equity Institute. Way of starting 2019. And start these sessions are designed to set the stage for future county legislation to address institutional racism in the way we conduct government business. So this is really the first step 
and it is to adopt legislation at the end of this year to establish an equity policy in the county. So again, every decision we make, so whether it's a land use decision, a budgetary decision, a policy decision of some kind that is constantly examined and seen through that lens, so we can hopefully uh, begin then to see some real progress. In addition to the racial equity training, the county is now a member of the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, or GARE, a national network of governments working to achieve racial equity and advance opportunities for all. A social movement that only moves people is merely a revolt. A movement that changes both people and institutions is a revolution. GARE has worked with more than 100 local and regional jurisdictions across the country to advance racial equity. If we are to get to the kind of democratic, just society we want, it's only going to happen locally. Community engagement activities on these issues will continue through the spring and fall of this year. Montgomery County is a great place to live and work, but there are persistent opportunity gaps. The council will receive a baseline report outlining the opportunity gaps here in the county. The council will identify interventions needed to achieve racial equity based on feedback from the community. The council will then identify specific interventions and use them in developing legislation on racial equity and social justice, which the council expects to enact this fall. This town hall meeting is a first step in talking about how we can work to eradicate systemic racism to benefit the next generation of Montgomery County residents. We want to hear from you. Why does racial equity matter to you? Are you impacted by inequities by race and ethnicity in your daily life? And what do you see as some of the changes that could be made here in Montgomery County to reduce racial and ethnic inequities? who has been leading the charge on this issue. She is going to do an overview of racial equity and best practices, um, just very quick, in order to also set the tone for the conversation. Dr. Thank you, Council President. So let's, here we go. So good evening, uh, my name is Elaine Bonner Tompkins and I'm with the County Council's Office of Legislative Oversight. I've been tasked to provide some additional context for tonight's uh, conversations that will occur at your tables or, sorry about that, is that better? Okay, I'm Elaine Bonner Tompkins, I'm with the County Council's Office of Legislative Oversight and I've been asked to cover a few uh, important um, topics um, to help set the context for the community conversation that will um, occur tonight. So I'm going to go over what racial equity means. I'm going to also uh, cover best practices that local jurisdictions have used to advance equity, racial equity. And my source for this information is the Government Alliance for, on Race and Equity, which you saw referenced in the video. And then to further help ground our discussion, I'm gonna go a little bit more into some of the data um, that was also shared in the video around um, disparities by education income, housing, and employment here in Montgomery County. So what is meant by the term racial equity? Um, as noted in the slide, the first set of comments at the top, racial equity refers to closing gaps in outcomes so that race no longer predicts one's success, while also improving outcomes for all. Um, for example, in education, racial equity refers to closing opportunity gaps so that neither suspensions nor graduation rates are predictable by race or ethnicity, while also enhancing outcomes for every student subgroup. Um, to close gaps, GAIR recommends that local jurisdictions center their efforts with communities of color to target improvements among those most burdened by racial inequities. They also recommend moving beyond a focus on individuals and services to a focus on changing systems by transforming policies, institutions, and structures to advance racial equity. 
So this slide provides a close-up of three best practices for advancing racial equity recognized by GARE based on their work in more than 150 jurisdictions. The first best practice is to normalize the pursuit of racial equity as a goal for local government. Use of racial, racial equity frameworks to develop a shared understanding of how race has shaped um, government actions and outcomes, as well as acting with urgency to enhance the public's will to advance racial equity are two specific strategies that make up this best practice. The second best practice is to organize for racial equity by building the organizational capacity of local governments to advance equity and also partner with other institutions and communities to advance equity. So tonight's town hall and the conversations planned for the community um, in the upcoming weeks are examples of this best practice in action. And then the final best practice is to operationalize for racial equity by implementing racial equity tools that identify and change policies, programs, and practices that are perpetuating inequities, and also using data to develop strategies and drive results. And so the county's commitment to developing a racial equity and social justice policy aligns with this recommended best practice. So the Government Alliance for Race and Equity finds that as jurisdictions implement best practices to advance racial equity and social justice in decision making, there is often a shift in organizational culture towards equity. As noted in the slide above, initial efforts to advance equity often focus on increasing the diversity of staff. But there might be limited effort to include people of color proportionally or in actual decision making. These efforts can lead to tokenism. Secondary efforts to include people of color focus on, on including them in the discussion, but may not lead to equity if people of color included do not hold significant levels of decision-making power. As the number and percent of people of color increases, however, their influence in the decision-making process often increases. And finally, Gare finds that equity emerges when local jurisdictions are driven by a relentless focus on the conditions in the community and a recognition that governments must develop and implement policies and practices that eliminate racial inequities and increase success for all groups. So this slide describes the key distinction between equality and equity. Equality refers to treating everyone the same with equal resources. This focus on equal resources, however, is only fair if people start out at the same point. As noted in the graphic above, hopefully you guys can see that, everyone having a similar sized box to stand on does not enable the shortest child to see over the fence. Equity acknowledges that different people start in different places due to racist historical context. Equity also acknowledges the benefits of giving everyone what they need to succeed equally. Equity is about equal outcomes rather than equal resources. And in the illustration above, equity is achieved when the shortest child receives two boxes that enable her to see over the fence. Uh, moreover, social justice is achieved when the fence blocking the view is torn down. So in this final slide, I wanted to offer an example of how um, our racist historical contexts have fostered disparities in education, employment, housing, and income by race and ethnicity. Uh, so this data was compiled by the Urban Institute, and it shows that white, Asian, and black adults in Montgomery County generally had similar levels of high school completion and some college education between, between 2011 and 2015. Um, whites, Asians, African Americans, and Latinos also had similar employment rates, ranging between 73 and 78 percent. Yet black and Latino residents were more than twice as likely as white and Asian residents to experience unemployment and poverty, and Latino and black children were six to seven times more likely than white children to live in poverty. 
Additionally, about three quarters of white and Asian households owned homes in the county compared to only half of Latino residents and about 44% of black residents. If differences in educational background and labor market participation were the primary drivers of disparities in unemployment, housing, and income, we would expect a narrower set of disparities by race and ethnicity or no disparities at all. So that re ends my review of key concepts, and I'm going to pass the baton over to Council President Navarro. Thank you so much, Dr. Francis. All right, so uh, Tiffany Ward is going to now join uh, over, and she is going to explain the group discussion rules and guiding questions. And I am going to also mention that those of you in the back, I know we're setting up some more chairs. Um, at some point, we'll have to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to, to gather. Um, all right, so Ms. Ford, if you can uh, go over the ground rules and how we're going to do this. Well, firstly, hello and good evening. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Eyes wide open. This is obviously um, on the minds and hearts of a lot of residents, and I'm really glad that you guys came out tonight. My name is Tiffany Ward. I am the Racial Equity Community, community uh, Manager, Community Engagement Manager for the county. Um, I'm just really excited that we're doing this work. I'm going to give you a little breakdown of how we're going to do this. As you can see, this is a standing room only. Um, set up. We actually had not expected so many people. We would like for you guys to, at your tables, uh, you will be having what we're calling community conversations. Uh, the community conversations will be around the three questions that we have here. I'll read off the questions. Um, and then you are to speak with your scribe and to talk to one another about all these questions. The scribe is then going to write down all of your answers or most of your answers and then report those out at the end of this session. Um, we are still trying to figure out how we're gonna handle the standing room only folks. Um, if you would just give me a second after we start this and I will, uh, I will think about that and then we will likely have you guys sit together uh, if you are seated uh, and talk about these questions amongst yourselves. Um, yep, here we go, start here. So our first question, uh, for residents, as a resident, how are you impacted by inequities, by race or ethnicity in your daily life? How are members of your family and or community going to be in, are impacted? The second question, what changes do you want to see to promote racial equity and social justice in Montgomery County? The last question should be, is your organization or group addressing racial equity and social justice? If so, how? If not, what activities uh, and if any are envisioned? If you are not associated with a group, I'd like for you to talk about if you are willing uh, to participate in a conversation or organizations that deal with racial equity, and if so, what issues would you like to take up? Okay. So we have, we have 20 minutes for these conversations at each table is actually a sign-up sheet that we're hoping yes, folks fill out. That. And then there's also um, a notepad, a pen, and a copy of the set of questions. We're asking that each table select a scribe who will capture uh, responses. If you already, you might already have a scribe, but if you don't, yeah. um, get a volunteer. And then um, after 20 minutes, we will reconvene and have some reporting out. For those who are on the margins of the room who are not at a table, I have extra copies of the questions if you want to scribe them. Um, but, you know, it's your call. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah. We also have 